Mr McCabe. Mrs Main, I'm uh, grateful to have secured this uh, debate and glad to have the opportunity to serve under your chairmanship. I uh, first became interested in this area through the work of the Acorns Children's Hospice in my constituency, which provides a valuable service to children and families from all over Birmingham. I can't praise their work too highly. I want to begin by acknowledging that I believe the government is genuine in trying to establish a clear funding path for children's palliative care and hospice services. The major change envisaged by the government, as I understand it, is the new per patient funding system. I think it would be helpful today if the Minister could say more about how it will work and how he plans to ensure that it's properly monitored and reviewed. I also want to raise the issue of short breaks and bereavement care, as these elements are not included in the per patient funding strategy. The Children's Hospice Movement supports the principle of per patient funding for children's palliative care as a means of providing more sustainable and transparent funding through an NHS currency commissioned by clinical commissioning groups and designed to complement NHS England's commissioning of specialised children's palliative care services. As I understand it, the third strand of government thinking is that local authorities should continue to be responsible for commissioning necessary elements of social care, and that together this should create an overarching system where all elements of the care, clinical and non-clinical aspects and short breaks and bereavement support are all provided for. My purpose in seeking this debate is to address a genuine fear that the impending general election and uncertainty over the new system could lead to a funding hiatus which could have a damaging effect on the children's hospice movement. The per patient system is designed, if I've understood it correctly, to reimburse providers according to the activity they undertake and also incentivise both commissioners and providers to deliver palliative care in a child's home, community or hospice setting if that is consistent with the child and family's wishes and clinically appropriate. The idea of the currency is set out in the NHS England 2014 document developing a new approach to palliative care funding, a revised draft for discussion. The currency, it is argued, should make it easy for clinical commissioning groups to understand the specific needs of children with life-limiting conditions. It should also be possible for clinical commissioning groups to have a better understanding of what constitutes palliative care and the potential cost drivers for commissioning. Can I ask the Minister what steps the government plans to ensure that those elements of palliative care not covered by the new per patient funding system will be properly funded by local authorities and clinical commissioning groups. This new system is the product of hard work and, as I've indicated, the sector is generally favourable towards it, but worried about a number of aspects. For example, how will the costs which providers incur during the transition be met? These new costs include setting up new systems to record activity and the ongoing data collection demands. The government commissioned palliative care funding review by Hughes, Hallett, Kraft and Davis in 2011 was clear that introducing and implementing the new system should be cost neutral to the sector. What support does the Minister envisage for the voluntary sector providers to enable them to implement this new approach? 
it would be really useful if the Minister could outline if there are any plans to provide models of practice which show how the currency will work, especially in situations for children and young people subject to continuing care packages and personal budgets as introduced by the Children and Families Act 2014. It would also be useful to understand how the data quality will be monitored and how comparisons of models of care and outcomes will be assessed. It's not clear to me how the new system will deal with the issue of transition from child to teenager to young adult. Give way. on securing this very important debate. Um, Acorns Children's Hospice um, serves my constituency as it serves his and have a fantastic hospice in Worcester. Um, they have done some very important work on uh, the transition space and the importance in supporting people uh, who, because of advances in medicine, uh, are living in many cases longer than expected. Would he agree that it's absolutely vital the government engages with them on this work uh, to make sure that transition is properly supported uh, with the future funding system? Uh, yes, Mrs. Mayne, I, I, I entirely agree with that. I think that, that, that's exactly the point. It's, it's fantastic that uh, so many of these children now survive for so much longer, but it does create new demands, new service needs, uh, and they, they have to be considered. And uh, I, I'd be grateful if the Minister could indicate what work is being undertaken both within government and the NHS to ensure that these uh, transition issues are being considered in any new uh, funding plans. Uh, I entirely concur with the Honourable Gentleman on that. The, the Care Quality Commission itself, of course, in its report from the pond into the sea, that's its title, I kid you not, <laughs> Children's Transition to Adult Health Services also actually indicated that this, uh, this focus is very important. So as we move towards the election, it would be helpful if the Minister could clarify where we are with all of these plans. As I've said, I acknowledge the intention is to create a fair and sustainable framework. But we're now in March, Mrs. Main, and the projected launch date for the introduction of the new non-mandatory currency um, is actually March. Uh, and as yet, we don't know the government's intentions. Unless I've missed something, we don't actually know the intentions. So we're in March. This is the projected launch date for, for the new non-mandatory currency. What I'd really like to know, and what I think the hospices would like to know, is what's going to happen with the hospice grant? Is it the intention that it should continue during 2015 2016 and perhaps beyond. I'm sure the Minister can appreciate that not knowing is a real source of anxiety and a real blow to any attempt at long-term planning. Almost 96% of children's hospice organisations are worried, according to the Together for Short Life survey, they're worried that CCG funding will be less than their existing grant and harder to access. That grant covered about 13% of the care costs incurred by children's hospices, and existing clinical commissioning group funding represents about another 12%. Uncertainty over almost 25% of previously guaranteed funding is a difficult basis from which to operate. As I'm sure the Minister knows, these bodies rely massively on public generosity and fundraising efforts, but they also need some core guaranteed funding. If the grant ceases and it's not matched by equal funding elsewhere, that could lead to 89% of children's hospice organisations being forced to reduce their services. And the areas that are at risk include short break services, which affects over 60% of their users. I'm very grateful to uh, the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. 
Um, as somebody who spent uh, 14 years in the children's hospice movement working for them as, as a fundraiser, completely aware of the point that he's making, and that short breaks are incredibly important because they're not only a break for the child that needs it, but actually for the whole family. Often you'd see people arriving on a Friday looking utterly exhausted, and just being able to have some normal family time by Monday was a great relief. It, isn't that the importance of these important short breaks? I don't think we can in any way uh, overestimate the importance uh, to, to families uh, and to, to children themselves. I think both need space at times, and I think the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. The risk is that uh, the survey suggests that over 60% could lose that uh, service. There's also a, re uh, a risk of a reduction. Around 35% is estimated and family support work, which is the other area connected with short breaks that enables many of these families to keep going in very stressful situations. And a further risk, Minister, of a reduction of 23% in the amount of end-of-life uh, care support provided itself. So short breaks, uh, as we've heard, they provide respite for carers and families. And they should be funded by local authorities and the NHS under the respective legal short break duties. But um, despite being key providers of short breaks, a third of children's hospices report that they are not recognised by local authorities as being short break providers. And 42% of children's hospice organisations currently receive <coughs> no funding from local authorities. Page 56 of the Palliative Care Funding Review Report states that pre-bereavement support is an essential part of palliative care and should be fully funded by the state. But the review goes on to say that far from being universal, only 65 to 70 per cent of local authorities have open access services. Without the children's hospice movement, there will be a gaping hole in end-of-life care. Mrs. Main, I, I'm not here to criticise the government's intentions, but the combination of the election and a new system with many unanswered questions does risk significant funding problems. As organisations both try to tighten their belts and take on new responsibilities, there is a danger that they'll fall back on what they know or believe that they know. It won't help the children or families of children with life-limiting conditions if CCGs fall back on a narrow clinical model which focuses on the child's health needs as defined by doctors. And the currency shouldn't be used as a top-up for the acute sector providers who are able to access other tariffs to fund care for children with life-limiting conditions. Palliative care for children with a life-limiting or life-threatening condition is an active and total approach to care from the point of recognition or diagnosis throughout the child's life to death. It embraces emotional, social and spiritual elements and focuses on enhancing quality of life. It also supports the family and includes managing distressing symptoms providing short breaks and care right through to the point of death and bereavement. This more holistic understanding of palliative care is reflected in national policy documents such as NHS England's Action from End of Life Care 2014 and the Care Quality Commission Handbook 2014. I welcome the interest that the government has shown in what has often been a neglected area. But we're now at the stage where we need some clear messages, actions and signals to ensure that this valuable work isn't wasted and a funding crisis which can easily be avoided allowed to develop. Local authorities under significant financial pressures are highly unlikely to fund what they might see as additional services unless required to do so. NHS England's draft currency for children's palliative care 
should be accompanied by clear guidance to local authorities on funding short breaks and bereavement care. I'd also like to hear an assurance from the Minister that the structure is clear and that the intention is a three-source funding arrangement. NHS England commissioning specialised children's palliative care and utilising the experience of the children's hospice movement. Clinical commissioning groups commissioning general children's palliative care using the new per patient funding system and again working closely with the children's hospices. And local authorities required to commission social elements of palliative care such as short breaks, bereavement care and support for siblings and other members of the, of the family. And again seeing it as their duty to work with children's hospices. It's vital that all three funding sources complement each other. If not, there's a risk that local authorities will regard those services included within per patient funding as the entirety of palliative care and avoid playing their part. NHS England's specialised care could fall prey to a narrow medical model and never leave the acute hospitals. We need something specific that distinguishes what it is that the government intends between specialised and general palliative care so that one side is not tempted to avoid its responsibilities by relying on the funding of the other. We also need to know that the NHS and local authorities are clear about their duties under the Children and Families Act 2014, which places a duty on them to jointly commission care for children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities up to the age of 25. I urge the Minister to provide what answers he can today to a valuable sector which is eagerly awaiting his response in these matters. Well, thank you, it's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this afternoon. Can I start by congratulating the Honourable Member for Selly Oak on securing this debate and for his uh, gracious recognition at the beginning of the Government's commitment in good faith to try and get this right. And I wanted to begin by paying tribute to the efforts of thousands of people who work so selflessly uh, for children's hospices around the country. Without their efforts, supporting the most gravely ill children and young people, we wouldn't have the world-class hospices and the palliative care services that we do. And I wanted also to thank honourable friends for Worcester and Pudsey for their um, uh, comments this afternoon in support. Uh, indeed, we're fully aware that the reliance of children's hospices on volunteers and charitable fundraising reflects their comparatively recent historical development. They do not receive as significant a proportion of their funding from local health and social care commissioners as their adult counterparts, and this has been a long-standing anomaly, and one which many in the sector perceive as threatening the sustainability of children's hospices. This is something which the government, uh, since its inception, has taken extremely seriously. As has been mentioned, we made a commitment in our coalition agreement, specifically aiming to place hospice funding on a more equitable and sustainable footing through the development of a new per-patient funding system for all hospices and providers of palliative care for adults and children, which would provide a transparent basis for local commissioning of palliative care services. And I'm proud to say that this process has been accompanied by unprecedented direct investment in children's hospices. We pledged in the coalition agreement to continue the annual allocation of £10 million to children's hospices, and this was increased, I'm delighted to say, by 7% in 2012 to take account of new providers. Now allocated by NHS England, this grant has been increased again to £11 million. In addition, there have been ad hoc grants of £19 million in 2010 11 and over £7 million in capital grants in 2013 directly to children's palliative care. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the annual allocation is a central grant in lieu of consistent locally based commissioning, and it's to that which we need to move, not least because local commissioners have a better understanding of local need and how palliative care services <coughs> can be integrated with other care. The Independent Palliative Care Funding Review in 2011 highlighted the absence of good data on the cost of palliative care and proposed the collection of data on an unprecedented scale through a series of pilots, one of which was specifically looking at children's palliative care. And since those pilots concluded in April 14, the considerable data generated covering all aspects of contact between someone being supported with care and the professionals delivering that support has been analysed with the aim of identifying a currency that captures patients' clinical and resource needs. Honourable members will understand that a useful currency has to group healthcare into units or packages 
which are broadly similar in terms of what's provided and the resources needed and provide a common language for discussing the commissioning and delivery of palliative care. That ultimately is the aim. And to give local commissioners the basis for having discussions with providers about what's needed and how it's to be resourced. Clear, reliable data on the complex care that's provided to severely ill children. And there's been good progress in developing this currency, although none of the many providers and professionals which have been involved has been under any illusions about the complexity of the task or the importance of getting it right. And a document setting out currency units has now been published and engagement has taken place with clinicians, providers and commissioners to test it out. The currency units are being developed into a currency framework that can be used locally by health economies for further testing. And NHS England, Mrs Main, intends to make this available for 2015-16 along with that supporting guidance. Honourable members will note that when we, what we have not done is rush into imposing a new funding system on the palliative care sector, and we've worked extremely closely with many different providers in taking this forward. I know that there is, in some quarters, some unease that there'll be a sudden transition towards a new funding model. However, as we, as we have previously placed on record, and I'm happy to do so again today, our aim is for commissioning of children's and adult hospices, which is fit for purpose, and that can only be guaranteed by testing the implications of a new funding approach with palliative care services themselves and by exploring locally how it would support more effective local commissioning. And this includes how it must dovetail with other local services. And there needs to be a planned and gradual transition to a new system with CCGs supported and able to take a strategic view of how palliative care for children fits into other children's services and other uh, services for children with complex needs such as special education needs and social care. And I'm entirely in agreement with the concerns which have been raised that there should be as much integration as possible of the commissioning of the different services for children with life-limiting conditions and their families, although we do believe that, for that, that there needs to be flexibility as to how different commissioners work together to coordinate provision. Supporting that joint working and exploring how to affect correlation of specialised and local commissioning of palliative care with social care will be a very important part of the guidance and other support made available during transition. It would be up to NHS England to consider what direct financial support might be necessary for hospices and other providers, and it's not a decision which can be made before the thorough testing of the currency has enabled us to understand the implications. And clearly, appropriate guidance and case studies of good practice will be an important part of that, which I know the Honourable Gentleman raised. In terms of future allocations, just as we don't wish to see an abrupt transition to a new funding system, we're similarly not intending to abruptly end the existing financial support which is provided to children's hospices. We're committed to ensuring that children's hospices are properly supported in a way which is fair and sustainable. And this means making sure that there's a planned transition from a central grant to local funding when the time is right. <coughs> NHS England has responsibility for determining the future of the allocation to children's hospices. And I know that that allocation has been prioritised as a commitment for 2015-16. I would also expect when the route towards implementation of the new currency is clearly mapped, which it's not yet, that there would be consideration given to the impact of transition on providers and how that might be reflected <coughs> in any allocations made centrally during that period. A decision on programme budgets generally is expected before the end of March. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman raised the issue of transition and ensuring the sustainability of funding is of course not the only issue facing the children's palliative care sector. As we've heard, with increasing numbers of young people with life-limiting conditions benefiting from advances in medical science, as my honourable friend, the member for Worcester, raised, al allowing their conditions to be stabilised, there is a growing demand for more effective management of the transition to adulthood. Palliative care is not only about end-of-life care. It can provide vital support for living one's life. But the setting needs to be age-appropriate and geared towards providing support in moving to independent living, further education and employment. Adult hospices do not typically provide the right environment for that and children's hospices are often not resourced to provide a separate and markedly different type of, young, of care for young adults, although I know that some people are developing facilities catering for independent young people. We know from the CQC's report that there's a pressing need for action across the NHS as a whole to improve how we meet the challenges of transition. Our system-wide pledge, Better Health Outcomes for Children and Young People, in, signed in 2013 by the major health organisations, includes a clear ambition to secure care coordinated around the individual young person with complex needs to deliver a positive transition to adult services. There's undoubtedly more to be done here and it needs to be taken forward as part of a coordinated approach to meeting the needs of young people with complex needs. 
There is increasing emphasis in the integrated commissioning and delivery of public services by the NHS and local government generally. We've recently introduced a new statutory framework for the integrated support of young people up to the age of 25 with special education needs or disability, which brings together the local authority and the CCG to drive coordinated assessment of need and planning for the individual child. The role of palliative care for young adults arguably needs to be fully integrated within this sort of framework of holistic support, and it goes without saying that this would go beyond a narrowly medical model of care. I think we'd all agree that developing a new currency, a new funding framework for children's palliative care is only one part of developing more integrated services for children and young people. And I'd highlight that we have separately invested £54 million over the period 2011 to 15 16 in the Children and Young People's Improving Access to Psychological Therapies programme, interventions which help children and young people who've been Im impacted by family bereavement. I want to touch on short break services, which my honourable, um, the honourable member opposite mentioned. Um, this remains a key priority for the government, and we're very much aware of the invaluable support that they provide to disabled children and their families, including for those who need palliative care. That's why between 2011-12 and 14-15, £800 million has been made available to local authorities to, for short breaks through grants. We've also introduced a short breaks duty, which requires all local authorities to provide a range of short break services for disabled children and young people, and to publish a short break statement explaining what's available locally and how it can be accessed. accessed. I'd be happy to consider how we might ensure local authorities are fully aware of the role of children's hospices in, hospices in acting as potential providers of short breaks. Uh, Mrs May, in the last few minutes available, I wanted just to try and deal with all the questions that uh, the Honourable General Officer raised. If I fail, perhaps I could undertake to write to him and cover them off uh, properly. Uh, he asked about uh, what's going to happen to the hospice grant and will it continue. Um, NHS England have made this uh, a priority for next year, but they haven't yet formally agreed their programme budgets, but I believe we can be very confident on the undertakings I've received that this will continue uh, as it is. Uh, he asked about support for voluntary providers, and it's very clear that this will emerge from the testing of the currency. There's no dispute that that will be included. He asked about plans to provide models of practice. Yes, guidance on implementation will cover this, and he asked also about how data quality will be maintained. And again, testing of currency will include quality assurance built into it. He asked also about whether we'll commit to maintaining the NHS England Children's Hospices grant until a new system is in place. And I can guarantee that we will ensure children's hospices continue to be supported in their work and there is no question of the grant stopping before alternative arrangements are in place. NHS England have made it a priority but they haven't yet agreed their programme budgets. And uh, he asked about the new funding system for palliative care. We've published the currency document and have commenced testing locally. We don't want to rush into a system which isn't fit for purpose. We want to work with local providers and commissioners to empower them to have effective commissioning discussions. Uh, Mrs Mayne, I hope I provided some reassurance to yourself and to the Honourable Member that there's a firm commitment on the part of this Government to see the children's hospice sector supported. And I would expect, given the strength of cross-party feeling on uh, the importance of these issues, highlighted today by contributions to the Honourable Member for Pudsey and Worcester, and any future Government to continue this, and in particular to continue the work that we've commenced in providing a stronger local basis for commissioning of children's palliative care, and I'll happily write to the Honourable Member opposite with any points that I haven't been able to cover off properly in my remarks. Order.